good morning. I'm happy to talk about my research today. The slide projector worked just the moment that I needed it to, so I'm very happy about that. Um, can I get a quick show of hands of like anybody who's ever like watched Star Trek? Okay, great. I'm glad. Right. So like in Star Trek, like the basic premise is that we live in a galaxy full of other civilizations. We can fly around and go visit them. Uh, and this is, I think, coming out of like this idea that humanity is just one of many types of life in the universe and that we might go out and meet those other forms of life. Uh, but in real life, we have no idea whether we are alone or not. Uh, as a professional astrophysicist, I don't think there are any credible claims of you know, other life visiting the Earth in history, but I do think that it's super possible that in the billions of other stars and the billions of other solar systems that are out there, that there might be other forms of life that exist in our galaxy and in our universe. Uh, so in the process of trying to understand our place in the universe, astronomers found, uh, up, so up until about 1995, we, even though we had all this, you know, this media and these ideas about what kinds of life and what kinds of civilizations might be out there, we did not know for sure if there were even any other solar systems, any other planets beyond our own solar system until the year 1995. And so in 1995, the first uh, planets around other stars were confirmed and discovered around other, uh, in other solar systems. And since then, there has been an explosion in the number of planets and solar systems that we know about beyond the Earth and beyond the solar system. And so I just pulled this down uh, a couple of days ago. NASA maintains a website of what they call their exoplanet catalog. Exoplanet is just an abbreviation for extrasolar planet or planets beyond our solar system. And so to, to this week, as of this week, there are 4,016 confirmed planets around other suns that we know about in our galaxy, and then nearly 4,000 more candidate planets that we haven't confirmed yet. And these 4,016 planets reside in uh, nearly 3,000 planetary systems, so a lot of these planets are actually in multi-planet systems, and these are true solar systems. And in accounting among all these different planets that we know about beyond our own solar system, we can break these planets down into a few different categories. There are, they're coming in all different types of sizes, so a lot of them are, as uh, this chart points out, some of them are larger than the Earth, Neptune-sized super-Earths, gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn in our own solar system. But about 161 of these 4,000 planets that we've discovered are, in fact, around the size of the Earth and likely have a similar mass. And so there are other Earth-like planets out there uh, that we are interested in seeing whether they have life or not. So if we, uh, so rocky worlds are common in our galaxy. And so the next question is we want to know if they're habitable and if they're in fact inhabited. So if you're asking a question about whether a planet is able to support life or not, one of the things that I care about most is, uh, in fact, a few different definitions of habitability include talking about whether this planet could have an atmosphere, whether it has a surface. So for example, the gas giants in our solar system don't have surfaces. Uh, you need the temperature that would enable liquid water to exist. We think that life requires liquid water as we know it. And then you actually need water to be there. It's no good if you have the right temperature, but there's no water on the planet. Um, and then finally, the, uh, one of the most important things, and the thing that I study in particular, is the presence of the chemical ingredients necessary for life. And so I'll talk about what exactly I'm talking about in a moment. Um, when it comes to our study, our direct study of planets beyond our solar system in our galaxy, uh, we've gotten really good at, astronomers have gotten very good at detecting these other worlds and starting to figure out some of their basic properties. So here I'm showing a schematic of the size of the sun, if you were looking at the sun as a disk, uh, and then how big each of, the, each of these three different planets in our solar system would be if it blocked out part of the light from the sun. And so one of the techniques that we use as astronomers in studying these planets around other stars is we'll wait for them to cross in front of the disk of their stars so that they absorb some of the light coming from their stars so that we can study them in more detail before and after that silhouette happens. And so for planets like Jupiter, we have actually gained the technology and the, um, the technique necessary to actually study the atmospheres of these worlds in part by waiting for them to cross in front of the faces of their stars and measuring the absorption for different, different gases as that uh, starlight goes through the atmosphere of these planets. So this, the reason I'm showing the schematic is you can see a planet like Jupiter is much 
simpler and easier to detect, but a planet like the Earth is this little dot down at the bottom here. And so if you're trying to study the atmospheres of planets like the Earth, the amount of signal that you have available is just so much smaller that it will actually be another 20 or 30 years before astronomers have a hope of systematically studying the atmospheres of some of these Earth-like planets that we can already dis detect and discover right now. It's just very difficult to characterize them. And so I want to suggest an alternate path, and I sort of do this a little bit tongue-in-cheek because this is actually my work. If we can't figure out whether these worlds are habitable right now, the next best thing we can do is figure out how they form so that we can study whether it's likely that they're going to have the ingredients necessary for life. And so that's what I work on. And so this is a, 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 just a picture of like what the Earth might have looked like if it didn't form with water and with carbon and with nitrogen and the other chemical ingredients for life. Even though it would be the right temperature, it would be a bar dead barren rock, perhaps like the moon or mercury, and wouldn't be able to support life as we know it. So I'm an astronomer, and I work with telescopes. And so I'll show you some of the telescopes that I work with. So I've, I've worked with the Herschel Space Observatory, which is a, a NASA and European project that's orbiting around the sun following the Earth. Um, I work with a telescope in Spain. This is a dumb selfie of me when I was 23. Um, there's this great telescope in Spain in, this, in the mountains near Granada that's uh, a good place to do research. I've worked with telescopes in France that link together to create high resolution images and spectra. And I've worked with this interferometric array in Chile that you might have heard about as part of this big network of telescopes that imaged the first black hole recently. And so I'm a radio astronomer. I work with radio data. Uh, this is something that I do to try and understand how the Earth and other planets form. So when I'm talking about life's chemical ingredients, one of the simplest things you can do is look at the human body and break it down by elemental composition and see how much of the human body is made up of different elements. And it turns out that 96% of us by mass is made of just four chemical elements, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. And so when I'm talking about understanding whether planets get the chemical ingredients for life, I really care about these four ingredients first. And then there are a lot of other trace species and other types of uh, materials in that remaining 4% that are also important. But these are the ones that I'm going to start with. Uh, and when we're talking about building planets, I really care about making a distinction between rocky planets, like the world we live on, and gas giant planets, like Jupiter and Saturn. Because we don't know if gas giant planets can support life, but we do know that at least one rocky planet has life. So when you're building up a planet, there's a distinction to be made between the rocky or refractory materials that go into rocks and that form up the mass of a planet like the Earth and what I call volatile materials that are easy to evaporate. I'm talking about gases, certain liquids, what we call molecular ices, which includes water and methane and ammonia and stuff like that. If you're building up a rocky planet, it's going to be mostly made of refractory materials. But all the ingredients for life that I just listed are commonly in volatile materials. And so then the question is, how do you get something that's rocky but also has some of this volatile stuff that's necessary for life. And if you look at the rocks that are in our solar system that would have formed right at what we call one astronomical unit, which is just the distance between Earth and the sun, the rocks that formed there would have been close enough to the sun that the sun would have evaporated all the water that might have otherwise been in these rocks. And so if you just smushed together a bunch of rocks that formed at one astronomical unit from the solar system and you built the Earth out of those rocks, it would be much drier than the Earth is today. It would have less water. This is a, just a depiction of what, how big the Earth is and how big a sphere of all of the Earth's water would be if you smushed it all into one big ball. And so you can see the Earth is still like not mostly water. The surface is covered in water, but most of the Earth is rock. And so I'm going to show a chart. This is a chart of the water content of rocks that formed at different distances from the sun. So the further away a rock forms from the sun in our solar system, the colder its environment would be, and therefore the more water it can retain. Uh, and so if you look at, let's see if this laser works. Laser, nope. Um, so if you look at uh, the, the Earth's distance from the sun, which is at what we call one astronomical unit, which would be right here, the rocks that formed here are very dry. And so our current understanding of how the Earth formed is that you take a lot of rocks that formed at a variety of distances from the Earth that have different amounts of water, you shuffle them together, possibly because of the way in which the planets are moving around and causing gravitational interactions, and you build up an Earth that's made from rocks that formed at lots of different distances. And so our, our planet is sort of a mixture of all these things. So when I'm talking about uh, forming a habitable planet with the chemical ingredients for life, 
I do care about water. I also care about carbon, nitrogen, uh, other materials. Water, we think we've got a handle on. When it comes to nitrogen, especially, we really don't know what the original place that the nitrogen that got into some of these rocks that built up the Earth came from. A lot of the nitrogen in the interstellar medium out in space and in the, the star-forming clouds that uh, give birth to solar systems have nitrogen in this molecule called N2. It's actually, this is the same molecule that was in the air that we're breathing. 78% of the air that we're breathing is N2. And there's a lot of nitrogen in this form in space. But uh, and N2 happens to be super volatile. It's one of the most major volatile carriers of some of these elements, so it doesn't go into rocks. It's not chemically process. It doesn't chemically process very easily. It's kind of inert, and it's really hard to, de to detect. And so the thing that I do in my astrophysics studies is I try to identify which other carriers of nitrogen, these other molecules and other types of materials that contain nitrogen, could have brought the Earth its nitrogen. Uh, and in this context, and I'll uh, sort of wrap up my work in just a moment, uh, I study star formation in order to understand planet formation. And so in star formation, we start with this gas cloud that starts to condense and collapse into a central object, which we then call like a class zero protostar, which starts to have ro some rotating material around it, which then uh, becomes this cloudy thing with a protostar in the middle and a disk around it. Over time, as we go through these class one and class two stages, this disk becomes bigger. The cloud sort of starts to go away and collapse onto the disk. You get just this isolated disk, which then becomes a solar system that where all the planets are in a line uh, in a sort of well-ordered plane, just like the solar system that we live in. And so this is the framework by which I try to understand star and planet formation, which happen together. Uh, most of my observations focus on this class zero and class one stage. So I'm studying materials that become parts of planets, but they're still in this cloudy and dusty gas stuff when I'm studying these materials. I just finished my PhD thesis, and so I'll just share with you the, like, the barest snippets of my work here. Uh, when I like, write this, all this up, you know, I organized it into chapters, and I got to present it to my committee and everything. This was all three weeks ago. Um, and I basically, I talk about my studies of nitrogen-bearing molecules in star-forming regions in the universe. I won't walk you through all the technical titles of my work, but I will share some of the takeaways from what I do. So one of the things that I found was that uh, we have evidence that the nitrogen that ended up in the Earth came from interstellar dust rather than some of these gas molecules. And also, when you use radio telescopes to observe nitrogen in different environments, you can study both the physical and chemical conditions of these disks that start to form in these, in these clouds where stars are being born. Uh, and this is a really useful technique to get more information about how these young protostellar systems are evolving and starting to make planets. Uh, my PhD is the smallest amount of work. It seems when it, we're talking about these big questions, everybody who ever does a PhD can only make a small dent in like the frontier of human knowledge. I don't know if ever, any of you have seen this like cartoon before that I'm linking here, but the idea is that all of human knowledge is a big circle, and a PhD is just like one incremental like step in making further progress on the domain and like the frontier of human knowledge. But the piece of things, the, the piece of this that I can sort of offer to take away is figuring out the original carriers of Earth's nitrogen can help answer whether life's chemistry is common or rare on rocky worlds like ours. That's what I've got prepared, thank you.